Well, hi, this is Mark Helm. Last week we talked about and looked at an older episode I did on how to analyze expansions and I kind of updated it with numbers that I would be using today, January 2024 kind of range. And uh, I thought we'd do the same with a conversion. Let's look at how to analyze a conversion and let me update you how I'm thinking about it and what I might be doing a little bit differently in today's market from when I initially did that episode. So we're going to be talking about self-storage conversions today. So thank you for being here. I'm Mark Helm, the author of Creating Wealth Through Self-Storage and the creator of the Quick Start Academy, which houses much of the training that I offer, such as what we're going to be covering today. And we do have an upcoming live virtual two-day self-storage boot camp March 8th and March 9th if you're watching this in the first quarter of 2024 and you can find out more about it at a link below if you're watching this on YouTube or in the text if you're seeing this on creating wealth through self-storage or in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast. The boot camp is designed to take you from wherever you are now all the way to putting your first or your next self storage facility into service and we'll be covering like what's going on today in today's market. We go over a four phase strategy that I've used ever since I've been in the self storage business and you will get all types of uh, resources to use training to use, workbook, forms that we use in the business, and you will have all the resources you need if you want to be successful in getting in the self-storage business. And today, let's cover how to analyze a conversion. Now, many of you are new to this community. Some of you may have just received this or already seen this episode, but let me show you at least how I and the people I work with or train analyze conversions and we'll take it step by step and I'm going to interrupt the video and show you what may be different or what I'm doing different today as I analyze a conversion. So let's look at how to analyze a self-storage conversion together. Yes, we find ourselves today in a market where self-storage prices are very high. And these are some of the ways that we can get in this business and still get the returns that a small investor would need to make it worth our while. So in my opinion, conversions, and what I'm talking about when I say conversions is we take an existing empty building and convert it into self-storage, reduces some of the risk that new construction would offer. Usually there's no site work. Usually you can get your permits faster. And generally, you can start getting income a lot sooner than you can on ground up construction. So let's take a look at an opportunity. I have, I'm going to run the analysis as we do it together. So I have found an empty building in a tier two market in the Florida panhandle area. Now, I this is an active listing, so I'm not going to talk about the address or a lot of specifics on it because I don't know if we're going to do it and I don't have permission from the listing agent, but this is a real opportunity. So what we have found is a vacant industrial type building, metal clad on the outside. It's 48,000 871 square feet. Most of it is 17 feet clear height and up. And that's good because what that will allow us to do is to create it two stories if we want to in that 17 foot clear height space. Typically you need at least 16 8 to be able to put two floors in a warehouse environment. There is a approximately a 2600 square foot existing office area that is a one-story part of the building and sits center front 
And the building, although it's an industrial building, is not located in a heavily industrialized area. It's right on the outskirts um, of the, within blocks of the central downtown district. And the building's listed for $1.4 million or about $30 a square foot. So just like last week, the very first thing we do is has nothing to do with the financial analysis. What we do is we look at that sub market and try to estimate, make an educated guess, what is the self storage situation in that sub market? Is it oversupplied, undersupplied? I use Yardi. Yes, Yardi's expensive. And then some places I look, Yardi doesn't have data on it. So what I attempt to do is figure out how many facilities are in my market area area, approximately what square footage is in that market area. Then I look at what is the population in that market area. Again, I don't use Yardy right now. What I would probably do is look myself and get information from the competitors, look and see how full they are, or try to assess how full they are, or are they offering a lot of discounts. But I would also probably get a report from a, a vendor such as Radius Plus, there's other ones out there, and get a preliminary analysis report for a few hundred dollars that would show me what competition is charging, it would show me the what the uh, square foot per capita is and these things are again not exact but i will see if there's a big red flag but i'd probably get that report yeah. well it turns out that this building is located in a market area where there's under over five and under six square feet per capita of self-storage per capita in that sub-market. I mean, that's not a huge gap between supply and demand, but it looks like that sub-market could absorb more square footage. Ultimately, a feasibility report will give you a lot more detailed information, and we'll know usually what the exact square footage is that the market can absorb or what that person thinks the square footage is that that market can absorb. But for now, I'm going to make the assumption that there is some unmet demand in that market. If I start seeing seven, eight, over eight square feet, I'm very cautious about going in that market. That's why we do this analysis up front, just so we're not burning calories on something that a uh, sub market that we know is probably going to come back oversupplied. So then what I do is I, I've got to figure out, okay, if I've got an empty building, what can I put in this building? How much self storage can actually go into this building? Well, what we've discovered is that in a conversion process, typically you're going to get 70 to 73, 74% of your gross square footage will end up being income producing self storage. Now, given that there is a 2600 office area that's almost like a separate building to the two story warehouse, I'm going to deduct that from the total square footage of the building. And what I'm left with is 43,271 square feet that is clear height 17 feet. So what I do is I take that number 42,271 and I'm going to use 73%. So now I interrupt here because if there was no office, which I probably should have said in the original video, if there was no office, I'd probably use 70, 71% efficiency. In other words, on a blank floor, I'm going to get about 70 to 71% efficiency. Sometimes it's been as low as 68, sometimes it's been as high as 73, 74. But in a preliminary performance today, I would probably use about 70 because I'm going to carve out part of the first floor for an office. So I multiply that times 0.73. That gives me 31,588. So on a floor, I can get 31,588 square feet. 
but given I'm gonna try to put two stories in there, I multiply that times two. So that tells me I can probably get around 63,176 net rentable square feet of self-storage in this building. That's the number I'm gonna use. That is the gross amount of income producing square feet of self-storage that will most likely be able to get into that building. The next thing I want to do is I want to see what rental rates are in that sub market. Now I use a software program that will help me see into that sub market, but I didn't always have it. And if you don't have access to it, you can do and we still do this and compare it to the software but we will call the facilities in that sub market i want to see what they're charging i want to see if they're giving a lot of discounts away and i come up with what i think would be a per square foot per income number that will work based on what i'm seeing given that this is going to be inside a building this is going to be we're going to assume this is a hundred percent climate controlled building so when I called the facilities or I went online and looked at their websites I was looking at their climate control and I saw what they were charging for five by fives five by tens ten by tens ten by fifteens ten by twenties and I came up with what I thought would be a reasonable per square foot number in this sub market it looks like for climate controlled space $13.45 is a good realistic per square foot income number. Ultimately, we're going to at some point put a unit mix in the equation and look at what that unit mix would actually generate. But for now, I've got the square feet of self storage and I now have a per square foot income number. So let's start analyzing. Now, for this episode, I'm going to use the Storage World Analyzer. Just like last week, you don't have to use the Storage World Analyzer. You can use Excel. If you use Excel, though, go through the same basic steps I'm suggesting you go through. I wouldn't just run a perform of what it's going to look like when it's stabilized, because who knows how long it's going to take to get stabilized. So we're going to run a performa of this project, and we're going to look at how much cash it's going to take, what will most likely be the negative cash flow, and then once we're up and stabilized, what will be the positive cash flow, and what kind of values will this asset have when we're complete or five years, ten years down the road. So we're going to use Storage World Analyzer. Again, you can use Excel. If you're interested in finding out more about the Storage World Analyzer, We'll talk about it at the end of the video today. So when I go to the Storage World Analyzer, even though this is a conversion, you would click the New Construction tab and give it a name. We're going to call this episode 211. Now what we're going to do is put in the income information and the size. So this will most likely be 100% climate controlled building. Now I don't know the specific unit mix at this time. Like I said before, at some point we'll put it in. But for now, let's just put in the amount of net rentable square feet. And we're going to assume 1345 is the gross per, per square foot income number. So in this program, I would just put in the 1345 and the monthly income number automatically populates. If you wanted to put in the monthly number, the yearly would automatically populate. And we're going to have an office, so we will have some retail sales. So I'm going to assume that we're going to average about $350 a month in retail sales. Next, I come up with a preliminary construction budget. Now, this is a preliminary budget, so I'm not going to go through everything. But at some point, we will if this looks good. And I would suggest 
if you're new to self-storage, actually do it or get some support in coming up with a construction budget. There's a lot of resources at the Self Storage Association, Inside Self Storage, or you could call a contractor, someone who's been through the process. I know, for example, that in today's dollars, given the steel tariff environment we're in, that I'm going to spend $13 to $14 a square foot on my storage system and have it delivered there. I am going to spend about $4.50 per square foot on getting it erected. Electric, you know, lights, HVAC. So we're going to budget in a per square foot number. After looking at the building and reviewing it, I'm going to assume right now that it's going to cost us $37 a square foot to convert this building to self storage. Could be more, could be less, uh, but we based on what our experience is that's what would create a great product it'll look good but we're not going over the top with it there'll be uh, a number for re redoing the office area putting in new hvac upgrading the electric and redoing the outside a little bit probably cutting some holes in the building and putting glass in so that the doors can be seen let me interrupt here uh, today preliminary performa i'd probably be using 45 dollars to 48 dollars a square foot for a conversion it is in most cases the least expensive store system you'll ever buy no heavy gauge steel because unless you're building in a vacant high ceiling warehouse you have no structural steel because you're not even supporting a roof system. So um, today I'd probably use that number as the conversion cost. That would give me enough budget to do some exterior work, do you know the fabricated or storage system, erect it, upgrade some electrical, put some lights in, that kind of thing. That's probably the number I'd use. You can definitely do it cheaper. You can definitely spend more money, but that's what we're finding we're spending today on most conversions. Again, I'll fill out a construction budget or have someone fill it out for me, but for now, let's just use the $37 a square foot. Now, the next step is to fill out the acquisition and loan information. The building's listed for 1.4 million, so let's assume I can get it for 1,265. I put that in and I'm just going to estimate between the feasibility report and the preliminary inspections, approval costs, I'm just going to use a $20,000 number for the due diligence period. Now there's a lot of different loans I could have used, but I'm going to use, assume we're going to get a regular bank 20 year mortgage. I'm going to use 5.5% interest in today's market, 75% loan value. Just like the last video, today I'd probably be using about seven and a quarter, seven and a half percent interest on a regular bank loan, 20 year amortization. You may get 25, but probably 20 if it's a local bank. That's, those are the numbers I'm using today for interest. But because this is a conversion and part of it's going to be a construction loan, I'm going to assume I'm going to be able to get two years of interest only, which I most likely will be able to get. Next, we enter the project assumptions. And this is what makes a big difference on how we analyze deals over just doing a snapshot of what it's going to look like when the project's stabilized. Just like the expansions, I'm going to assume that my income rises at 3% a year and my operating expenses are going up 2.5% a year. And let me interrupt again here. Just like last week, I'm using 4% for average income growth per year. I'm using 3% for inflation over the next 10 years or operating expense increase. It yeah, you know, it, it might be a little higher this year, it might be a little lower year five, but I, you know, over the next 10 years, what do you think is going to be the average increase in operating expenses? Put it in there. Again, the whole game here is 
as an owner, even once you're in service too, make sure your income is going up as a percentage faster than your operating expenses. That gap compounds over time and that gap is what creates wealth for us as self-storage owners. We'll cover more of that in the boot camp. Now, depending on what kind of facility it is today, I'm going to use a seven cap rate for future values. In other words, in any given year, whatever this program estimates the net operating income to be, it will apply a seven cap rate to that net operating income to come up with an estimated value. And just like I said last week, I'm still using a seven cap for reversion prices. That What this does is it determines the value in years three, four, five, ten on the performa you're going to see. It determines what the value is. We're guessing in the future what cap rates are going to be used against the net operating income to determine value. I'm using seven today. Most appraisers are somewhere close to that today for future value. And again, I will assume my cost to sale will be two to three percent. We typically sell direct to uh, institutional investors. We don't usually list it, but you can put in three, six percent if you want. And stabilized occupancy. In other words, when this project gets leased up, what will the average yearly stabilized occupancy be? And it will apply that to whatever the gross potential income is to come up with a storage rental income number. So I'm going to use 85%. Now, here is where we actually put in the gross number of the building on top of the net rentable square feet that we put in the income tab. If you remember, I said that 73% of the building will generate income. That means 27% of the building is common areas. So that's the number that we put in the gross square foot increase area here. And then that will help on the construction number. I'm going to assume it's going to take eight months before we can start getting income. And that's one of the beauties of a conversion. You can get income much quicker. And given the low self storage per square foot per capita, in this sub market, I'm going to assume 1500 square feet net absorption a month. It could be higher, it could be lower, but that's a good reasonable estimate. And finally, to complete the project analysis, we need to fill in the anticipated operating expenses. My coaching is don't just put in a percentage number. You'll get some really weird numbers, especially in the first few years. Think through how are you going to run this? So for us, I think we'll have two full time people here. Now, in the first year or so, I won't need that because the first year it's under construction. Second year, we're in lease up. So I will reduce that number by half in year one and by a quarter in year two. And I'm going to put in a, a bonus if they hit certain lease up numbers. I put in a percentage for payroll taxes. And then I put in what it's going to cost to have a, a wet, good website, industry standard website, and I plug in some online marketing money. And just like I said last week, today I would go probably $10,000 for online marketing, maybe more. It would depend. In a conversion, you're bringing new space on, you really want to have a good online presence. If you're in a urban area or a large area where there's REITs, you're probably going to spend more. If you're more in a rural area, small town, you may spend less than ten thousand, but eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars is what I would be putting in today for online marketing expense. And again, in year one, 
I'm going to reduce that because part of that year we're going to be under construction. Next, I'm going to put in about 13 cents per square foot for ongoing maintenance items. Next, I put in a number for equipment, grounds, and I know a gate's going to go down or a camera's going to go out, so I put in a little bit of money for the security. If you don't know, call an insurance agent, but I think it's going to be about 9000 a year on insurance. And I got the previous owner's uh, utility bills, marked them up a little bit for uh, what we think the usage will be, and I'm coming up with an estimate on the utilities. Next, I came up with a what I think the taxes will be. Now, I got the tax rate and then I estimated a value. But think about it. In year one, you'll probably pay the exact same property tax that the current owner has. Then the, by the next year, your sale price will come into effect. And then it will go up a little bit more and then by year three you'll be paying tax on a self storage project so I'm just estimating here but I'm going to reduce the property tax 75 percent year one and I'm going to reduce it 50 percent year two and then by year three we should be paying what I think the tax rate will be in this market now let's look at some of the incidentals the bank service charges and visa charges most of that is credit card expense so given the amount of square footage here this is what I think the credit card expense will be I put in a number for all of the other ancillaries and these are based on experience again if you don't know what these numbers can be you can go to the many co storage almanac there's a lot of other publications that can and give industry averages. You can even do that based on location in the country. Now let's take a look at what this project would look like with these assumptions. Here it is. So it looks like we would hit break even about year three and that's what I would expect. It looks like we'll have about another 300,000 or so in negative cash flow years one and two on top of the 25% cash investment. That's about what I would expect. Here is what the debt report summary looks like. So the looks like total in this is a $3.6 million project plus the additional 300,000. So I assume I'm going to have about three nine in the project. It looks like our break even is going to be around 63-64%. Here is the lease up page. Since we're breaking even in year three, you can see that it would be probably in the last quarter that that would happen. That's normal, although I like to see that a little lower but it's normal that you would hit stabilized in the low 60s. And now the other thing I look at real closely or immediately is I look at what's the value going to be once we're leased up and stabilized. So for that, I go to the 10 year cash flow and I go on down, look at the bottom part of the 10 year cash flow. And I can see that this is going to be worth about six and a half million dollars, six to six and a half million dollars when I'm done. And I'm making over 20% cash on cash return when it's stabilized. Not bad. So for taking the risk of doing this project, you're going to make over 20% cash on cash return. You will have made two to two and a half million dollars of value. And then you can continue getting the cash flow or sell the project. So is this a deal you would do? Theoretically, it's a deal we would do. Now, what I will do is I'll run this deal with a lot of different assumptions. I'll slow down the lease up. I'll increase the construction costs. I'll reduce the construction costs. I'll change the building acquisition number. And I'll look at it two or three different ways to create a risk 
analysis on it. But these are the assumptions that I think it would ultimately end up looking very close to. Now, whether we go for this building or not, I'm not sure at this moment because we've got some other deals that we're analyzing and I'm going to be comparing this to those other deals. But theoretically, this is a deal that could work for us. Would it work for you? That's really the question. So my coaching is go out and find some opportunities for conversion, run the analysis in your area or the areas you're looking at and see if this type of way to get into the self storage business or grow your self storage business has appealed to you. The risk is it takes two to three years to start getting profitable. So it's got to be patient money. The upside is you're going to get higher returns cash on cash and you can create more value than if you buy an existing facility or perhaps even do an expansion. Well, I hope that helped. Conversions are great. I love them. I probably made more money doing conversions than anything I've done in the self storage space. I just, they're quicker. I can get income very often by leasing part of the building out that I'm going to be expanding into and just phasing my storage in. I've just had a lot of success and really enjoy doing conversions. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope this excites you to go out and find some conversions. And if you're interested in the Storage World Analyzer, which is the tool you saw through the video, there's a link at the end of this where you can find out more information about it. It's the one tool I use every day. And if you're interested in you didn't see the expansion video last week, you can there'll be a link at the end of this video where you can see same thing in today's world what's different on how to analyze expansion opportunities and again if you're interested in the boot camp feel free to click the link below in the text or in the show notes if you're listening to a podcast and i hope to see you there thank you and i look forward to being with you next week as we talk more about some of the basics of getting in or growing your self-storage business. I'll see you then.